All right, let's talk about the prevalence of ADHD. So according to the DSM-5 um, TR, it's estimated to occur in about 7 to 10% of children globally. Another 5% are very close to beating criteria. So that's roughly 15% of the children around the globe. 60 to 90% of the time, it persists into adulthood. 60 to 90% of the time. Girls and women are three times more likely to be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed with major depressive disorder, general anxiety, and bipolar, as well as borderline, um, you name it. The average age for a woman to get diagnosed with ADHD is 32. This is a neurodevelopmental disorder that begins in childhood. 32. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, some myths about ADHD. That it is caused by bad parenting, too much TV, video games, sugar, social media. No, none of those things are true. It's also not overdiagnosed. ADHD does not cause intellectual impairment. You can be smart. You can be gifted and have ADHD. Stimulants are not overprescribed. And you definitely don't have to be hyperactive to have ADHD. In fact, that's quite rare. So what's the truth about ADHD? ADHD is one of the most widely and deeply studied psychiatric conditions known. Stimulants have been used for ADHD type symptoms since the 1940s. <coughs> Excuse me. And ADHD appears uh, across all ethnicities, nationalities, and socioeconomic groups. Okay, I'm going to mute. <laughs> Are there any questions that anybody wants to address before we keep going? <clears throat> Okay, well, <clears throat> these two questions that are here already. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely get to these um, as we keep going. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So, as I mentioned, um, ADHD is not overdiagnosed, especially in the adult population. As it stands, up to 80% of adults with ADHD may currently be undiagnosed. Goodness. And it's not overtreated. 62% um, of children with ADHD are currently being treated with medication. So that's just about two thirds. All right, let's take a dive into <clears throat> the neuropathophysiology of ADHD. And we'll do that first just by reviewing normal neuroanatomy. And let's start with the limbic system or the reptile brain. The limbic system is among the oldest parts of the brain in evolutionary terms. Um, it can be found in fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. It's also known as the reptile brain or midbrain. Limbic means border. It's the border between the cortex and the brain stem. <clears throat> there are several important structures within the limbic system itself, such as the thalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, cingulate gyrus, basal ganglia, and hypothalamus. The thalamus acts like a switchboard. All sensory input comes, you know, through the body into the um, thalamus first. And the thalamus then sends those signals out first to the amygdala, hippocampus, and hypothalamus and basal ganglia, and then on up to the cortex. 
it's the signals get to the amygdala, hippocampus, and hypothalamus and basal ganglia much more quickly than they do to the cortex. The amygdala, we have two amygdala, one in each hemisphere, and this is where emotions emerge. I know I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know, but the amygdala labels sensory input as safe or threatening, and we do that rationally or irrationally. Um, the amygdala Amygdala initiate fight, flight, or freeze, aka the sympathetic nervous system, and send the emotional labels to the hippocampus for memory storage. The amygdala is also responsible for sexual arousal and learning based on reward and punishment. <clears throat> the hippocampus is where memories are stored, and it's this whole wrapping around section. It's kind of got the two arms here. Um, and it's particularly new memories about past experiences are stored in the hippocampus. The cingulate gyrus lies just above the corpus callosum, which connects our two hemispheres of the brain. And that participates in emotional reaction. It links sights and smells to emotion. The olfactory bulb is like right here. It helps us regulate behavior, attention, and alertness. <clears throat> the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is, sits just above the amygdala, and that's responsible for our autonomic functions, the things we don't have to think about, such as respiration, um, thermoregulation, maintaining our body temperature, metabolism, it's also involved in peripheral sympathetic nervous activity, um, sexuality, combativeness, and hunger. All right, so let's recap what's happening in the limbic system. The limbic system is where emotions emerge and basic survival instincts arise. Fight, flight, freeze, eat, and reproduce. All right, let's move out um, towards the um, cortex of the brain and talk about the lobes of the cortex. The prefrontal cortex, highlighted here in this orange oval, um, just in front of, just above your eyes and your forehead, is responsible for our higher cognitive functions, um, emotional regulation, planning, reasoning, considering future consequences of current actions. From an evolutionary perspective, most it's the most recent area of the brain to develop, and it's also the last part of the human brain to develop across our lifespan estimated to reach its peak development somewhere in the late 20s or 30s. <clears throat> okay, continuing on to the remainder of the frontal lobe highlighted in blue here. Um, and this includes the primary motor cortex, as well as Broca's area of speech, which is the area that allows us to, um, to speak and express our words and our um, language. It plays a role in muscle cord control, attention, judgment, and movements. And now the temporal lobe highlighted here in green. The temporal lobe is where we process language, which is Wernicke's area of speech and how we, it's how we receive language. It also plays a role in long-term memory in coordination with the hippocampus. And it plays a role in interpreting the meaning of visual input. Now in the yellow area here is the parietal lobe. And this is the sensory area of touch. Um, the parietal lobe has a lot of jobs actually. It integrates all the sensory input from all the other lobes and coordinates all of the process processes and inputs from all other regions of the cortex. It also helps us recognize our position in space and senses time. I'm going to skip over the occipital lobe here. This is the visual cortex. It really does not seem to be much involved in ADHD. So we're really kind of mostly focusing on the areas that could be involved in ADHD today. We're going to go down to the hindbrain or cerebellum. And the cerebellum is responsible for coordination of muscle control. 
There are also some cognitive functions that happen in the cerebellum, including um, attention, language, and um, some emotional control. 